Welcome, Peter, to the World XP Podcast. We've been playing Instagram message tag for a little while now, but uh, happy to finally have you on. Obviously, you had your big run of shows in the last couple months, uh, and so now you finally have some free time, and here you are. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad we found uh, a few hours to sit down and chat. Yeah, for sure. And so for those who don't know, uh, actually, I'll let you do the introduction because I was about to get that wrong, what exactly you do. <laughs> I um, I wear many hats in the music world for the most part. Primarily, I am a professional opera singer, currently training at the Academy of Vocal Arts in Philadelphia, which is basically a a world-class professional training program, and the goal is to go there for a few years, get an agent, and then kind of get fired out into an international career. So it's a really good place to be. Uh, but outside of the opera world, I also produce music, uh, mostly a cappella music. Uh, so I started making a lot of that during the pandemic. Um, and lately I've been kind of actually pulling some older elements of uh, music production back into my, into my stuff, which I can talk about later, some upcoming projects. Uh, but for the most part, it is opera singing and a cappella music for the most part. So, and I found you through your, you, for those listening who don't know who Pentatonix is, you should probably figure that out. Um, <laughs> but I found you through a Pentatonix uh, reaction video. And so that seems to have been another thing that you've picked up um, also during the pandemic as well. Yeah, yeah, good point. I, I sometimes, I still think of myself, you know, far more as a musician and singer than a the reaction analysis person, but that has really become like a huge part of my online identity. So yeah, during, during I think it was July of last year, I decided to make a reaction, a reaction video, which really is more of a, it's a reaction and an analysis. So I'll watch a video that's three or four minutes long and I'll break it down musically over the course of like half an hour talking about vocal technique and the arrangement and the instrumentation and other artistic choices. And so I started that last July with uh, Jeff Castellucci's Far Over the Misty Mountains Cold. I believe that was my first official one that I did. Um, and yeah, so that has become a huge part of my, really my, ma my main thing I do on YouTube at this point because it's, uh, in terms of how much time it takes to make those videos, it's far less than putting together a huge cover. So the covers come every, you know, couple months, every few months, and I and I put out a, a reaction analysis video every week. Yeah. So I think um, that was one of the things that drew me to you. I forget what, it might have been the prayer. So I was looking, I was looking yeah, at I, different reaction videos, um, but one of the things that set you apart for me anyways was the analysis part because you could see anyone and everyone react to the song and like for by and large most people have the same reaction or similar reactions to those sorts of songs but right. one of the things that when i was watching your videos having had a uh <laughs> a little bit of musical training uh myself was the in-depth in the way that you were able to to break it down and one of the things that I talk about a lot on this podcast is how people are just great at things. And so to have somebody understand the full greatness of a group like Pentatonix is mm. like really interesting to me because like I can hear the different things, but to actually have it laid out is was for me super interesting. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad that's been your experience. That was my goal going in because I I do not like reaction videos when it's just you know, a five minute video for a four minute song. And it's like a brief intro, a bunch of silly faces. And then, all right, guys, see you next time. So I refuse to do that, even though that's like what was, what is really, or at least was really popular. I'd like to think there is now a movement towards the reaction channels like mine and the charismatic voice and some other people who are actually breaking things down. Cause you'll find that people, even without musical background at all, if you're pointing things out carefully, then they learn a lot about the music and they appreciate music. So, you know, so many comments I get on my channel, it's like, oh my gosh, I've been listening to this song for five years and I never heard these things and now I can appreciate them more. So that's like a huge win for me and is the, the primary objective of my videos is to both be entertaining like a reaction video, sort of, but really it's more like an educational experience about this great music, like you said. 
Yeah, no, it's awesome. I think just listening to other music, gen- music is such a, I'm going to go into a little bit and then we can jump back into your, your opera stuff. In sure, a little yeah. bit. But m- music for me, like it touches on a, a boundary a little bit outside of like the normal social norms in a certain way. And the way that you can tell a story or communicate something to someone without, I mean, with, with obviously there's lyrics, but even without lyrics, there's a way to convey a message or a story or have that. And then the other thing that's really cool about it is that, especially if there's no lyrics, it's up to each person's own interpretation of what, Mm -hmm what that is and i never understood that when i was like doing music class or whatever because you'd be like oh like you'd have a music teacher tell you when you were like 12 to interpret and like well what what does this make you feel and you're like i don't know like <laughs> it's like it's one of those things and i and i also say this a lot that i wish i could go back and take some of those classes now with the understanding that i have mm-hmm. like to be like okay let me actually think about this and sit down and think about what does it actually make me feel but you for yeah. you being well i guess you consume music obviously also but for, of course for the production side of music like for example your sound of silence cover mm. were you when you were arranging did you have anything in mind or did you are you just kind of going with how you feel about like the piece or how like i don't know that's a yeah, lot of yeah. that but like how does that work for you so when i make a new song about half of them i'll do a formal arrangement so i will actually put everything down very carefully in sheet music and then record it pretty much exactly like that unless of course I'm recording and I'm like oh wait this would be cool and then I'll do something different or add something else in and the other half I will just basically pull the audio file of the song throw it in a in like logic or wherever and just like go in my booth and start recording parts just like listen to a listen to the bass line and record the bass line how I want to in that moment um, as far as sound of silence I actually I was in an acapella group at JMU exit 245 and we did a cover of Sound of Silence, and right when Disturbed came out with that version, I think in like 2016, mm-hmm. that was like a song I knew was going to be a part of my life, and was a song I wanted to interact with and like dive deeper into. So it was really cool we got to do it with the acapella group. Um, and then as soon as the pandemic hit, I was like, I'm going to try doing this. Like making that was my first one I did. I'm going to so I'm going to try making a multi-track acapella recording all by myself. Um, and for that one, it was a formal arrangement. So I I went through and was, you know, carefully picked apart all the instrumentation from the disturbed version, which is what it's based on. And then of course, set that to voice. And then because I'm a bass singer, I of course tried to highlight that part of my voice more. So you have the start of the song and it's just this duo. One is slightly lower than the other one, but it's like low bass stuff. And then basically going through the song, um, you can open up and make songs more interesting. It, quite literally, if you open the vowels up, so if you start a song on an M, mm, then if by the end you're on an A, ah, mm, ah, you can hear it in short time there. So it makes the song much more exciting throughout. So the first verse is just two voices. Then I think voices come in on ooh, and then they move to all. Oh, and the last verse is everyone just like on ah, and it's like this huge climactic finish. And then, oh, then right at the end of the song, it kind of pulls back to how it was in the intro. But as as far as how I actually composed it, it is all kind of what I'm feeling in the moment. And I, when I do arrangements, I try to listen to parts, but not put them down exactly how they are. I try to listen to have an idea of how they go, but then like make up my own kind of version of that melody or that set of harmonies, however they're structured. Um, so they're not exact. Like some some acapella arrangements are called transcriptions, where you really just take the exact instrumentation and just put it into voice, uh, which is a skill on its own because you still have to choose syllables and like figure out the octaves and the registration and stuff. But I try to get like a general idea about the original and then like make my own version of it basically, um, which I talk a lot about in my videos. I think the best way to do a cover is to you know, like stay true to the kind of core nature of the song, but then put your own spin on it, uh, so to speak. Uh, so that that's how that one worked. That was my that was my first one I did all like that was my first project I did in this like weird pandemic adventure of making a cappella music, and it was uh, actually a formal arrangement. Well, so when you like you're arranging how you feel in that moment, when you listen, like if you listen back to it, 
do you ever think, oh, like maybe this this line could be changed or not like not but like the the part of the recording could be changed for maybe what yeah. cool if I did this or that instead? Yeah. The biggest one for me is I in some of my earlier arrangements I wish I took bigger risks almost. Mm-hmm. Um because now the the more I've been arranging, the more I've been able to add my own kind of creativity to songs. And so like closer to the beginning, they were more transcriptiony. Not exactly like we just went over, but as I've, as I've done more arrangements, I've gotten a little more adventurous with stuff. Um, and just like being willing to basically being more willing to try and, I don't think fail is the right word, but just kind of go for it. And like, maybe it doesn't work out as well as you want, but I was kind of taking a lot of, I think safe routes back when I was just getting started with the arrangements. And that's something I would go change. But for the most part, um, I find that when I start arranging something, I'm really excited about it. And then there's this long period in the middle where I'm like, uh, this is like pretty lame. And then like kind of right at the end, I like it again. But then I listen to it way too much, and I'm like, okay, this sucks again. <laughs> it's boring now. And then I'll put it away for like six months, and I'll come back and be like, wait a second, this is actually, this is actually like pretty good. Um, and so I am, I am overall quite pleased with all my projects I've done in the past. Um, but it is funny to have the reference of like, what was I feeling at that moment? Like when I was making this, I, you know, I thought it was the worst thing ever, or I thought it was the best thing ever. And it pretty much never turns out to be either one of those things once you've, you know, gotten to take a big step back from it. Yeah. When you talk about taking risks, what does that mean for you musically? Like, I like you, I understand for, like, the first thing that came to mind is if you have a song that's more well-known, maybe you take oh. less risks because people know, the, people know it a little bit more and... Mm-hmm there could be a reaction that way, but also you have to balance out how you feel about the song and kind of not like, yeah. not care what everybody else thinks, but you kind right. of got to do you, but, but it's, there's like a weird balancing act. What, what does that mean for you to be risk taking? I guess. Basically kind of what you just said, like uh, the further away you get from a, a transcription, basically. So the more, the more you add to the core nature of a song. So, you know, for some pieces, um, I remember I did an arrangement back in undergrad where I just wrote a completely original introduction for a song. This is probably my favorite arrangement I did back in undergrad, and I arranged a lot for that group, um, where I just basically wrote this, like, chamber choir intro, and it was, like, a minute long, and then it kind of transitions into the into the actual arrangement of the song. But if But when the song starts, you have no idea what song it is. So like that was a big risk that worked out super well because it's literally nothing to do with the original song, but just wrote my own my own original music and like wove it in. That would be like a risk. So you could do that and maybe, like you said, for something really popular, if you start off the song with a totally original segment, people are going to be like, I don't know, like, what is this song? This isn't the song I was expecting to hear. And if it's a minute long, chances of them clicking away is like 99%. <laughs> you know, unless yeah. they're already, so that's one, so that's one. So, uh, creating your own harmony, your own, just putting more of your own thoughts into a song that's already been established. And the second one is taking risks vocally. Um, as an opera singer, we're trained to like basically be perfect vocally all the time, like perfect breath support, consistent vibrato, the right space, the right amount of tension in your vocal tract, all that stuff is supposed to be like perfect. And so something I've been doing more and more with these covers is like really pushing myself vocally and kind of trusting that my voice is going to be fine. Um, For some projects coming up this summer, I've done a lot of like really high, pretty hard, like belting, Um, basically like healthy yelling, pretty much (laughs) like (laughs) at the very top of my range, like really pushing it. And of course my voice is fine. It's trained. The voice is, is, it's these, it's these tiny little, like the vocal folds are tiny, but they're really resilient. It is actually difficult to damage them. But opera singers all the time feel so scared about that because it's our whole, it's our whole livelihood. It's our whole career. So even though opera is the most powerful singing in the world, like if you're going to hurt yourself, it's probably going to be doing that, right? Because like, it's so loud 
and so powerful all the time. But like the vocal folds can handle it. So that's what I've been doing more of lately is just like being willing to push myself vocally where I wouldn't have gone even a year ago. Yeah, that makes sense as well. I think when, when you talk about pushing yourself, I think everybody who's got some aspect of performance, whether it be musically, athletically, anything, there's some aspect of pushing the limits of what you can do. And that's always interesting for me when I'm talking to people on the podcast. It's one of the things that's been really cool about the podcast. I get to talk to all sorts of different people. But one of the things I get to talk about is w- like what pushing themselves like or yourself means to that person in that industry. And it's always cool to hear how in touch that person is with their craft you know mm-hmm. it's very interesting and then and to hear you like you i can tell that obviously you know exactly what you're talking about but there's like um and kind of in like intuition you have with like you know exactly what you meant when you said i'm gonna push myself because you've spent so much time training with it yeah whereas right. somebody will say well i just want to push myself and they're vague about it mm-hmm. they don't necessarily know and that's a very cool distinction for me to hear when i when i'm talking to people very cool yeah yeah so yeah that that's the other thing about building an operatic voice is kind of uh one of my teachers called it vocal engineering because mm-hmm. basically the whole goal of, of building an operatic voice is for your entire range you're going to be using an opera you want to be able to sing basically on every vowel, on every pitch, so every half step da, 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 throughout your entire range. You want to be able to completely maximize the efficiency and power and control of the sound. So you basically have to methodically go through every half step on every vowel, you know, singing in all these different languages and be able to sing everything completely perfectly. So, yeah, if you have trained like, I guess technically I've been training almost 10 years as an opera singer, but really I didn't give a shit until four or five years ago at most. Mm -hmm. And since then it's been really serious. Um, But yeah, so like for me, when I say pushing myself, it's like, you know, a high belt on an F4 on the piano. Not that difficult. I can do that fine. F sharp gets a little more difficult. G, then like once you get up to like G, A flat, way up there for a bass voice is like if you are not absolutely, it's like it's like walking a tightrope. If you're not completely on your support, if your vocal folds are not, if not coming together exactly how you want it, your voice is going to crack or you're going to miss the note or something like that. So that's the kind of stuff I mean with pushing myself. So there's this in in my in my cover that I'm uh, a new cover that's coming out in May. I have this huge sustained A flat. And I had to record it like 25 times probably, which of course is really tough on the voice because I would get, I would get like five, six seconds in and my voice would, would crack up to falsetto, which is the, Mm. which is a, a voice crack really is a a defense mechanism for the voice. It's like basically what's happening, just a really quick voice science thing in your chest voice, you're using all of your vocal fold mass. So the, I believe the thyroid muscles, which is like 75 to 90% of your vocal folds plus 10% mucosal membrane, which is just the edge. In chest voice, you're using the whole thing. The whole, the whole apparatus is vibrating. When you flip up to falsetto, it's just the edge. So basically what happens is as you're getting higher and higher in chest voice, the, all that mass is stretching, 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 stretching. And then at some point, it just cannot withstand the stretch anymore when it's stretching all of the mass, so it releases a bunch of the mass, so it's just the vocal fold, just the membranes, and then you flip up into falsetto. That's a very long explanation of what happens in a voice crack, but it's really it's really a defense mechanism. It's like, if you keep sustaining that with your full vocal fold mass, you like increase your risk of injury, basically. So for me, recording this belt, I had to get it so that the whole belt, which is like, it must be like eight or 10 seconds long, and like it's like basically just a huge, loud, breath supported yell at that point um i finally got it to where my voice stayed fully in chest the whole time but that's something i never would have attempted even probably six months ago it's like really for me the last few months have been like really learning how to push myself vocally outside of the opera world i know how to do it in the opera world because i know operatic technique super well 
but doing stuff like doing stuff in genres outside like rock style singing or anything non-operatic is it's not new i've been singing all these genres for years but to push myself in those genres is a new thing yeah the same way like you're saying to get up to that range for for like for trumpet which i played once you get up higher and higher the if the like once when you're in the range you can not be lax but the margin for error is a lot less the higher up you go yeah 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 um exactly and the and the like the tone and the pitch like it all has to be the like shrinks as you get higher and higher higher yeah right but yeah, one of the things that is interesting to me is when I hear people talk about singing. So you talked about opera techniques, but singing outside of the, the genre. I can hear, I think most people can hear the difference between like a pop voice or an opera voice or a rock oh, voice. Yeah. But like mm-hmm. when you're singing it, what is the the difference? Because I think people, for me, like back when I was watching American Idol, right, with, like, and the judges would be like, oh, you have a pop voice. Mm-hmm. But that's not, that might be kind of true, but also the ability to sing outside of that genre exists. So when you're singing and you switch up the genre, like, what what is going on with your voice that, to, like, switch that up, if that makes sense, from, like, a... Yeah, I, no, great, yeah. great question. Uh, the biggest difference by far between opera and pretty much any other genre is when you're singing an opera, the goal is to have what the Italians call a chiaro scuro sound. The chiaro is the brightness. So brightness in a sound comes from really tight vocal fold closure when you're singing. So if you've ever listened to like if if a pop star or a musical theater singer sings a really high note in chest voice, like I was just talking about it, there's a lot of bite and cut and like ping in the sound. That comes from high harmonics in the sound, which happens when your vocal folds close tightly. So in opera, you want to have that all the time. At the bottom of your range, all the way through the top. Whereas, you know, for most people, like I was just saying, it on, their vocal folds only really come together tightly at the top of their range when mm-hmm. they're like really kind of squeezing. Probably not singing properly either, most people. Um, but for opera, you want it throughout the entire range. So even in my low notes, really tight vocal fold closure, so it still has that chiaro. The scuro means darkness, so chiaro scuro means basically light and dark. The scuro in opera comes from a lowered larynx. So if, if me just talking normally here, this is my speaking voice. If I lower my larynx, you can hear how much more space there is now in the sound. It's like a much warmer, it's like a much warmer, darker sound as opposed to just speaking normally. Mm-hmm. So that's the scuro. So so in opera, you want to have a lowered larynx for a darker sound, a warmer sound, but you want to have really good vocal fold closure to get all that brightness. And so the result is this big, warm, dark sound that also has a ton of brightness in it. And the brightness in the sound is what cuts through an orchestra. And maybe maybe you know this already, but opera singers do not use microphones. Yeah. So, so when we're in, singing in a huge opera house behind a huge orchestra, we have to be so loud and have so much presence in our sound that we're able to be heard over an orchestra. That is by far the biggest differences between singing opera and singing anything else. It's just like the projection generally. Yeah, so projection. I'm, I'm, and, I remember and, seeing it and just being like, wow, those people are singing freaking loud. Yeah, yeah. Like, I feel like and, that must hurt. And loud and like the other thing is it, it has to be super sustainable. Mm-hmm. Like yesterday I had three and a half hours of opera rehearsal. You know, and my voice is fine. It's fine at the end of that. Because yeah. it's it's if you're and almost no one sings this way, even in the opera world, getting like true like I didn't understand this until a few months ago, specifically because I'm at an institution where the coaches have worked with the world's greatest opera singers for the last fifty years. It's like really if you are really fully supporting your sound with breast support and you are and you don't have like too much tension here you can sing all day, really loud all day, because it's just a fully, I mean, of course, at some point you yeah. will tire out, but but it, uh, you can sing for hours and hours really loud um, if you're if you're doing all the things right, <laughs> which is which is pretty crazy. That's nuts. So I remember doing rehearsal for band and stuff and being like, 
if we had a big concert or whatever, we had two or three like two hour rehearsals like every day beforehand. I remember I would be tired. Mm-hmm. And that for like and playing trumpet, obviously singing is more I would assume, well, if you're not doing it properly, is more tiring on the like muscles in here than playing a trumpet oh, would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so to hear that that if you do it technically right, that is some like not that you could do it all day, like you said, but that's kind of insane yeah. to me. It ex- it extends the period you can sing. You can sing for I mean, a, f- a few hours full tilt, like, a, like basically, and as far as how powerful it is, I mean, just imagine yelling loud for three hours. It's like that, basically. Yeah, um, like, it that. really is. It, it really is like healthy yelling when you, when you are doing it correctly, which is super weird. Um, what was I going to say? I had something else. It's um, interesting that you say that though, because I like going to like college basketball games or whatever, and you'd be after, like yelling the whole game and then my voice would just be done for Completely, after, after yeah. like an hour and a half. Yeah. Like, and like done as in like gone, like yeah. basically no voice left at all. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas for opera, it's like sing two hours of an opera. You still have an hour left to go if you're a lead role and you still have to sound like you just started singing, you know, <laughs> at the end of that, uh, it's nuts, which is crazy. Oh, also what I was going to say that the difference between the voice and an instrument, like you said with trumpet. Yeah. Cause like concert pianists, and I'm glad I don't do this because I don't think I could. I mean, concert pianists will go in a practice room and practice for eight to ten hours a day. Eight to ten hours a day. No singer can do that. No singer can sing that much. So for us, we re- there really is a limit. It is, I would say, th- you get if you're singing really well, three or four hours, three or four good hours, which is more than you want to be singing in a day. Really, you want to be aimed for more than like two. But you know, some days you have a lot of rehearsal. Um, and then the rest of that time is like studying, learning language, all that other stuff definitely would add up to eight to 10 hours a day. But as far as actual singing, we can't do as much per day as any kind of instrumentalist because this, even if you're doing a well, does tire out before, you know, your arms will, or your hands will, um, for other instruments. So is it when you guys are rehearsing, then they, the, whoever's in charge, I guess, I don't know exactly who that would be for for like what you're doing but they they know that then right so they can't like if you yesterday you rehearsed for three hours is that for you guys like for, for the singers abnormal none of this institution <laughs> it's it is notoriously so tons i mean it's like if you look at the alumni list it's silly how many like real opera like the whole mission statement is like training the next generation of opera stars basically and they all say their time here at this institution was by far the hardest part of their career. Mm-hmm. Like both in terms of like rigorous coaching, like really like the coaches at ABA are pretty tough on us as far as the standards, like I said, cause they've worked with the world's best singers for the last 50 years, but also just how much singing you do. Like you just get in crazy good vocal shape during your time here because you are singing more than you probably should and more than you will once you're out. But it kind of builds this foundation of just like really strong, secure singing. Um, my, my voice teacher thinks you should have basically two like pretty intense 45 minute to hour long sessions per day of singing. And that's like as much as if you could control the circumstances, that's how much you'd want to sing. But you know, we'll have an hour long voice lesson and then three hour long coachings and then a rehearsal in a day. And it turns out to be, you know, six to eight hours of singing. Now, of course, rehearsal singing is different. Like a voice lesson, for instance, you're singing or a coaching, you're singing pretty much the whole time. Whereas rehearsal, you might, you're, you're not going to be singing the whole time because you're likely going to be working in scenes with other people. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's much more off and on. So when I say a three hour, four hour rehearsal, it's not like I'm just standing there singing the whole time. That would be impossible. Mm-hmm. But but, you know, off and on for three or four hours. Um, you mentioned voice lessons and voice voice coaching. What? <clears throat> Good for, question. For, for, for those people that have no idea what that means, including... I didn't, even under, I didn't even understand that when I was a voice major early in undergrad. <laughs> it took me like a few years to understand the difference. So voice a voice lesson 
is just when you work with your voice teacher to work on technique. So that's like a bunch of vocal exercises, you know, working on tricky parts of your range, figuring that that's, that's the vocal engineering part. When you go to a coaching, you bring music that you've prepared or you bring a role that you've prepared and you work with a coach who helps guide you more like artistically. Now, a lot of these coaches are also, they also really understand the voice. So if there's a, a certain part of a, an aria, an aria is just a song from an opera. Um, if there's a certain part of an aria that is difficult for you vocally, then they'll, they can also chip in and try to help you sing it better while also contributing to the artistic, you know, delivery of the piece. So the coach is all about the artistic side, like how do you present this piece to the world convincingly? How do you present this piece and capture the character and capture the emotion and all that stuff? And your voice teacher is the one that helps you sing it well, like just the singing part of it. Mm. So you really need you really need both of them because if you just work with a voice teacher and you don't put in the artistic time, you might be able to sing it really well, but your performance still might suck or be boring because you're singing like a wet mop, you know. But, so you take you take the really good singing and you go to a coach, and then it becomes not just good singing and not just good capture of the character, but all those things together, which is what you need for a really compelling performance of anything. Gotcha. That's not so. The coaching part. Back when we were talking earlier about like the interpretation of, of music and different pieces and stuff, is that kind of what the coach does more? So yeah. that's interesting to me because I had uh, a friend of mine um, who's a band director now in Michigan somewhere. He was on the podcast before when he when they would do auditions for like for college band, and they would give them a piece and one of the things they would they called it or he called it lessons but one of the things that they would do is they'd go in and play a piece with like an interpretation and sometimes what he said was i was like well if you interpret it and the band director or whatever that you're doing the lesson with thinks that you're wrong or like the interpretation is like how like there you can interpret it but also there's a certain interpretation i guess that is seemed uh is deemed as like the norm i guess is that a thing as well in, in opera? Oh, yeah. like, so you've oh, got yeah. this piece and you're like, oh, I think it should be this way. And then you go to your coach and they're like, yeah, no, that's uh, incorrect, sir. And it's like, yeah. it's weird. It's weird because it should be your interpretation, but also there's like the right. And that's a, that's a kind of an oxymoron. I don't know. Is that the, yeah, I think that's the right word. It contradicts it, itself to me a little bit. Yeah, it's a good point. It is. I mean, it's all, it's all subjective really. And, mm -hmm. In opera, because it's such an old tradition, you're not only dealing with the coach's opinion, but you're also referencing all these old, you know, all these recordings of people who have performed this. Like, for me, my kind of go-to guy is that guy on this poster, Samuel Ramey. He's one of my favorite bass, operatic basses of all time. So when I'm learning a new song, I will pretty much go listen and see how he did it because his voice and my voice are very similar in in nature. Hopefully I will be as good as him one day, but that is a lofty, a lofty goal. Um, but just like our, we have basically the same voice type. So I'll go listen to him and see how he interprets. And then I'll study the music and I'll study the language and I'll study other source material and be like, okay, what was the composer trying to do? What's this character want in this scene? Like, Try to like become that character like you would as an actor. Um, and then you take all that to the coach. And then, you know, oftentimes the coach will have a different, a different opinion about one thing or another because there are a million different variables you can interpret differently, whether it's, you know, what to do on this dotted 16th note. You know, how do you want to, do you want to, do you, like, what do you want to, do with it? Do you want to uh, accentuate it in a certain way? Or do you want to pull off it? Or like, what would this, what syllable of the word is on? What, what would the character be trying to get at? It's like all these tiny little details that you could, you can go back and forth on all day. So really what you do in a coaching is unless you strongly disagree, you'll just try what they think. Mm -hmm. And then, and, but then really at the end of the day, you have to have your own intuition about it. You have to, this, this goes into putting on a compelling performance. You have to do what you believe is right. Because if you're making a choice because someone told you to do it, 
that's gonna that's not gonna read well to the audience. Yeah, like they're, they're trust e- it. Yeah, yeah. Even even people that don't know anything about opera, or, or that's the thing. Like you said about music, it touches you in a in a very special kind of way. And people that know nothing about music can tell if a singer is engaged or committed or not, uh, which is a pretty amazing thing. That it takes it takes all the training in the world to be able to do it, but. For someone to tell if it's like legit or not, you don't need any training at all. It's like human intuition, yeah. basically. It's very odd. Comedy is similar in that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very odd. I it's. I feel like personally, for me, that that would be frustrating. That you could spend mm. all this time training and training and training <laughs> and give like a near perfect performance. To some random guys like well, that part was weird. Yeah, it's uh. That's a big hurdle to get over because obviously to do this career, you have to care so much about it, mm-hmm. everything you do, but you have to, you have to get really thick skin, honestly, especially at an institution like I'm at where your every detail is picked apart every day. You know, you just have to understand that a, no one is a perfect singer or a perfect artist or whatever. And trust these people who have been doing it forever and don't take it personally because they're they're really at the end of the day they are just trying to make you better Mm -hmm. like they want everyone in that school institution whatever wants us to go be the next opera star it's not like they're shitting on us because they want us to quit yeah it can feel like that (laughs) sometimes but that's not the reason so as long as you keep that in your head and you just remind yourself like they are trying to help me just like Take it seriously, but also take it with a grain of salt kind of at the same time. Um, that's that's the way to get through it. Because people do, people crack at this institution. People leave after a year or two because it's just like, it's too intense Yeah, uh, for some people, yeah. That happens at, I feel like, any school or any anything like that where the standards are as high as they are. It's like there's a reason why right. like, school is the way it is, whether it's like buds for Navy SEALs or like, the Barcelona yeah. Soccer Academy, or like any of those things, is they're all this. They're, yeah. There's a reason why they produce the top in the world at whatever it is they do, and that's always been something that's been interesting to me as well. Like the to set a standard that that's that high, but at the same time realizing that nobody is a perfect singer or artist or whatever is like that's a very thin line. It's like yeah. you're striving for perfer- for perfection with the understanding that you'll never get there. It's yeah, a very odd thing to me. It is. It is very odd, and um, especially in the opera world, which is highbrowed, and like people uh, don't like it for that reason. And it is a real thing. It's very like snooty, or it can mm-hmm. be. It can mm-hmm. be very snooty, and so of course the people who have been doing it for decades and decades, they have very you know very strong opinions about things, and 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 you know if you if you are of an opinion for long enough, I think you do get to the point where you do think that opinion is kind of perfect and flawless. Mm-hmm. And so we do run into that with some of these coaches where it's like their opinion, like in their mind, their opinion is right and there's no debate. And that's, that's of course tough to, you just, and like I said, in a coaching, you just kind of have to say, okay, yeah. I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it your way. But then when I go, you know, do this in a competition or with some company out in the world, I'm going to do it my way. Mm. You know, so when you run into that at the school specifically, are is there ever has there ever been a time where the coach has felt that strongly, but you felt very strongly the opposite way and had like a very good good reason for it? And like, how do you deal with that? Because these people are kind of this is all they've been doing for forever, yeah. yeah. And so, like in like when. For me, when I've been in that situation with like a soccer coach that's been around the game for like 30, 40, like however long, but I like, I'm like, no, this is definitely like how I think is, is better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, sometimes I defer. Well, it depends on the situation. I don't know. It's mm-hmm. like, how do you, yeah. is it case by case for you also? Yeah, it's, it's case by case for me and the rest of the singers. And it's case by case for the coaches too. Cause there are times, I mean, I, I, so I am someone who, will push back against the coach much more than most of the people. Mm. Um, I think part of that is because opera isn't anymore the only thing I'm doing. 
you know, I have these other things that I'm doing, which helps. And I have like an actual career on YouTube or a job. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd call it a career yet, but a job on you, a job on YouTube. Um, and so for me, it's not, it's not all or nothing anymore. So I feel like I have more freedom to kind of push back a little bit. Cause I'm not, I'm not scared that this coach is going to like blacklist me as much as someone else might be. Um, but I think, uh, the coaches, some of them like it when you actually, I would say most of them do actually like it when you push back and have a strong opinion about something, because that shows them that you've really been thinking about it, which mm -hmm. is what they, is what they really want us to be doing. Like they, they have strong opinions, but if they see that we are really becoming like the whole point of going to this place is to become like a fully fledged artist, a fully fledged performer to go out there and crush it in the real world. So, you know, if we're coming up and we're just like a total sponge and we just do whatever the coach tells us, that's not going to serve us well when we get out, you know? So it's this funny balance of like, they have strong opinions, but at the same time, they like it when we have strong opinions because it means we're approaching it the right way. Some coaches, I'm not going to name names. Some coaches, some coaches do not want to hear your opinion. They just want you to do yeah. what, what they tell you. And of course they're brilliant. So like you can't, it's, and, and, and at that point it's just not worth it. Cause you know, if you push back, it's just going to, it's just going to be this yeah, yeah. butting head. So it's not even worth it. But most coaches I've found, if you push back the right way and have enough thought behind your reasoning, they're like, they might say they don't agree with it and they still want you to do it another way, but they'll at least acknowledge they're like, okay, I, I respect and I acknowledge that you've been, you've been putting in the time on this character or whatever. Yeah. That's really cool. I think because then it, even if you end up doing it the way that the coach wants, there's still a, there's still sort of a, mini reward for you thinking about it and putting in the yeah. time because if it doesn't happen that way you're like well what's the point of you thinking about this right right yeah, yeah. no that, that's really cool that they do that and again i think that goes to the excellence of the the place that you're at and that's why mm -hmm. it constantly produces those sorts of people yeah. um so now that this is you've decided that this and or youtube and or whatever else you're doing is your sort of career instead of doing your acapella in college and then going to get a, a normal job. When did you, <laughs> when did you make that jump or that leap of faith? Because a lot of people is very risky. And a lot of times when you tell like your parents were like, Oh, that's a dumb idea. It's like, you're, like, you're really talented, but what are the chances? That's always the yeah. thing. It's like, what are the chances that this actually works? Yeah. And the, the, the sad part is it's a very legitimate concern from the oh, parents' oh, side. Sure. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, for me, I've had a I've had a, a wild ride in the music world because I was all about sports in high school. Sports, sports, sports. If you ever talk to Chris, he can confirm. <laughs> Didn't I did I did some musical things, but it was never my I never really cared nearly as much as I did about sports. So I wanted to go to college for sports, track and football. I got some pretty good offers actually for both, but I ended up weirdly auditioning for music school because my mom my senior year of high school suggested I should take some voice lessons because she said I had a classical sounding voice, just like a resin, like a low resonant voice for a high school guy. And that voice teacher <clears throat> told me I should audition for a voice in college. And for me, it was either like, I had no idea what I wanted to study because I only thought about sports. <laughs> and so maybe like psychology or something. Yeah. Like um, most 16 year old boys. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I was living the high school life. Um, but I ended up getting into the University of Miami down in Florida for for voice. For you know, I sent in a, a, a tape of me singing a couple things that I worked on with that voice coach. Get into this. It's called the Frost School of Music down at the University of Miami. Very good music school, and so that ended up being my best offer. So I ended up going down there for voice, and pretty quickly I was overwhelmed. Like I didn't know anything about opera or what I was getting into. Didn't know music a, theory. It was opera already from the beginning. Oh yeah, yeah. So it was my major at that point was vocal performance, which is Did, a fancy, a, like basically a fancy way of saying opera. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, but living in Miami, electronic music is huge there, and I had just started getting into that my senior year of high school. So I, you know, I'm going to concerts, and I go to Ultra Music Festival my freshman year, and I realized this is I definitely want to start producing electronic music. 
And so that actually is kind of where my whole musical journey turned for the next like three or four years. I did two years in Miami, then transferred to JMU to finish. And not only did I transfer, I switched my major from voice performance to music production, music industry. So I started taking classes on audio engineering. All the while, voice was still my primary instrument, as you had to label it when you were there. So I was still taking voice lessons, although I skipped a lot and, like I said, did not give a shit. And I would still do an opera, like, like once every few semesters, I would, like, hop in the performance. Because, like, undergrads always need basses in the mm -hmm. choirs and the mm -hmm. operas because it, it's just a rare voice type. And there just aren't many of us around, especially at the undergrad level. So once in a while, the opera director would say, hey, I really need you to come sing this role. And I would and I would do that. But for the most part, I was producing electronic music. I was DJing. I was in the acapella group, uh, which was like a, a total joy. And that was my plan for years was to freelance as uh, a, a electronic music producer and DJ and like try to get onto like, you know, festival lists, like try to DJ at festivals. That was like my dream for a while. Um, I ended up doing four years at JMU. So I had a six year undergrad because when I transferred, switched my major and like my academic advisor was garbage. So like basically none of my credits transferred from Miami. So I pretty much had to just like restart undergrad. Um. My sixth year, fall of my sixth year, when of course I'm now thinking about grad school and what I want to do in grad school or if I want to freelance, um, I was I was thinking at the start of that semester, I was going to go to grad school for audio engineering. But I did a role in a show called Così Fan Tutte, which is a Mozart opera. And I sang this bass role and had so much fun that I completely rerouted my grad school plans from audio engineering and like composition to voice, like basically back in like that original trajectory of opera. So I ended up, and that was kind of when I started like the semester before that, so the end of my fifth year, I had to do my senior recital, and that would that was the turning point when I started actually training my voice again. Really, I was like, okay, I need to sound good on my senior recital, and I've been completely dicking around with classical technique for the last four years. So that was a turning point. So I started training for that, and then ended up going to my master's for voice, and from there, it's just it's just snowballed. Um, but that was the that was the journey of my kind of uh, planning was it was it started out as opera then I was like nope this is ridiculous let's do EDM production did that for a while and then right at the tail end of my undergrad kind of routed back to opera and that's been the main focus since. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, so like dubstep producer and opera singer. Yeah, <laughs> the most popular combination of genres. <laughs> Ever. Right, it's like the newest and the oldest, yeah, and like both super niche. <laughs> oh, that's what I was talking. So Matt, the guitarist that I, I mm -hmm. just released his, I didn't realize, or not that I didn't realize, I'd never thought about the fact that, I whenever you hear somebody's majored in theater or music, or whatever, it's kind of like when you're in college, anyways, it's kind of not scoffed at, but like. It's like, psh, what are you going to do with that? Because yeah. you, you feel like or everything you've been told up to that point by all the career people and all the this and that is like, go find a steady job and do this and do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so so he also majored in musical performance, obviously, for guitar. But I didn't realize, like, because you hear people who are successful in the music industry and, like, mm, not super often are they from that sort of background. Yeah, yeah. And so it's not that I knew you had gone to school for that, but I didn't know he had. And so that was kind of surprising to me to hear, like, I don't know. Yeah, I think schooling is uniquely helpful for opera uh, because so many other genres you can, you can self-teach to up to a professional level. Like you can become, and this is, this is really, I mean, what I, like I, I learned way, way, way more about audio engineering and producing, doing it on my own than I did in any class. Mm -hmm. No question. Um, and you can do that with, I would say, uh, definitely not every instrument, but, 
Um, something like being being a guitarist in like a rock band. Yeah. Like every, and I, I actually do know a number of guitarists because my friend uh, George is a professional guitarist in Nashville. None of them went to school for it. You know, they all just became really proficient at guitar on their own. Training classical voice is something you have to have really good instruction on and not just for an undergrad, but for undergrad and masters and then something like I'm doing now. It has to be like a like a basically a 10 year period where you have where you are disciplined about it and you have really good instruction because otherwise you just you can't build a voice that can survive in like a big operatic setting. There's just no way to do it. So yeah, I mean, most musicians I know who have found success just, you know, started doing it in high school, at least, at least in a, in a performance setting. Of course, like a music teacher needs to go to school, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but as, as far as people joining like bands or uh, producing their own music and stuff like that, almost none of them, I like studied it formally, it, but every opera singer I've ever met at least went through undergrad as an opera singer. Um, and then, you know, some, some people are really gifted at like naturally, like we do have a few people at this school here who just did undergrad and then came straight to ABA, uh, which is remarkable. Um, people who just are naturally really good at it and figure out enough about it during their undergrads, but that's rare. I mean, this, the, the place I'm in now is a lot of like mid to late twenties. Like it's really that final step before a, a full fledged career. Um, but yeah, as far as formal training, I think it's, it's unique to opera and, Probably like I mean something like uh, really like classical music. Yeah, yeah, like a classical, classical for sure. Classical violinist, a classical pianist, like they need rigorous instruction and training, like an opera singer does. You know. Yeah, is I guess why it's strange to me is because the people that are in the classical realm that go through all that instruction, it's like they're talented enough to do the other stuff as well. But they, yeah. I guess they, they <laughs> like it. They like it more. I guess is yeah. really what it comes down to. It's more of a challenge. That's yeah. what I hear from a lot of people. It's a, it's a constant challenge, uh, which is of course exhausting. But at the same time, if like the thing about a lot of a lot of pop singers, for example, is they have their like what's desirable in a pop singer is their natural voice. Mm -hmm. You don't want to hear a bunch of training. You just want to hear how they sound and how they emote using that natural voice. So you have people who are like fourteen, fifteen that can become huge pop stars. And their voices never really change as far as what happens with like biological maturity or whatever. Mm. So it's just like they have their natural voice. They use that voice until their career ends and that's it. Whereas like opera is this constant training, constant polishing, constant tweaking. And then the other thing is as your voice does mature biologically, you can start to sing different kinds of repertoire that are that you have to have a mature voice for. That's a, that's a really interesting aspect. So it's like a, it's this, it's like this lifelong thing where you're, you're constantly working on it as opposed to blowing up as a 15 year old pop star. And then that's just, you don't have to change anything. That's the voice people love. That's the voice people want to hear, you know? <laughs> yeah. When you say mature voice, what do you mean by that? Literal, literal biological maturity. So there are things that happen in your whole vocal apparatus as you age that change the sound. Um, there are, uh, not ligaments, there's tissue, uh, there's cartilage that ossifies, literally turns to bone in here and as you age. And I think it finishes that process by like late thirties or so. So your voice is going through a lot of a biological change all the way up through about 40 or so, and then it gets slower, but it does keep changing throughout. So for instance, and it takes longer actually the lower your voice is and the bigger and more dramatic your voice is. So like me as a bass, like I won't hit my prime as an opera singer until I'm like 45 or 50. Whoa. And there are, there are roles that I will sing then that I would break myself singing now. For example, just one example, Philip II in Verdi's Don Carlo is notoriously like one of the most huge dramatic bass roles and like if i tried to sing that with a full verity orchestra at a big opera house a you wouldn't probably hear just about any of it because part of that maturing process is just building up power and volume 
And so I would just be like breaking my voice to not even be heard. And it's like a four hour opera of like huge dramatic singing. And so you have to have a decades of training to do it well and B the biological maturity to produce the amount of volume and stamina. So there, so that's like, that's something that happens to young singers is, um, they'll start singing repertoire that's too dramatic for them too early and they'll have a really short career because they push their voice way too hard, way too fast when it's not ready. Whereas if you're smart about it and you kind of stay in your lane, so to speak, then you can have a huge career. I mean, there are, there are opera singers who sing until they're 75, 80 years old. Basis specifically, we, we have the, the, we, we can have the longest career out of anyone, which is nice. Slower to get going, but lasts longer. Um, whereas like a really high soprano voice, like the highest female voice type, they're really going to be past their prime by the time they're like 35 or so, right. whereas, whereas basis is another 15, 20 years. So you have, you can have, a, you can be a, like a, let's say a light lyric coloratura soprano. That's probably like the, the highest, lightest female voice type. And they can be superstars by like 25 singing in the world's biggest stages. But then by 35, it's like all the companies are looking for that next 25 year old superstar coming along, you know? Uh, so that's, so that's a really interesting thing about maturity and how it relates to the opera world. Whoa, that's, <laughs> that's wild. I didn't, so many things I've never even considered. That's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. That's so cool. You mentioned um, the piece that's a really big for basses, and that happened yeah. in, in band as well. Like mm. where there would be certain songs that, like the tubas or the trombones, would be like, "Hey, uh, can we do this one this time so we can have more stuff to do?" And it's like, <laughs> is that so? When is there a certain like? like number of like famous pieces where it's like yes this is another one of the base ones like when your coach or your whoever is doing the performances is, is like yes we're doing this opera and you get excited about it is there a certain amount of like ones that that happens for because i feel like for the bass sort of even if it's instruments singers whatever there's almost like a uh what's the word i'm looking for like the bass union i guess <laughs> is that a um, thing there, I mean, well, there are definitely a lot of roles I'm excited to do, for sure. From the standpoint of like all of, the, like, hmm, for maybe this will this this will help. Like in soccer, there's the goalkeepers union because it's like mm -hmm. they'll have a certain spot where it's like if they mess up, everybody knows it's them, but they go unappreciated when they just do their job because that's what they're supposed to be doing from the standpoint oh. of like mm. is that is it like a, a base union where it's like yes we are like the bases and everybody like has um, an appreciation for the baseline that like other people don't have type thing or is that not really a oh thing? there you mean you mean just like organ like an official thing or like an unofficial no, no un unofficial unofficial thing yeah there well I, i'm a part of a number of like big bass singing groups um sing groups meaning not like we sing together but groups of bass singers mm. Um, and like, we all kind of know each other yeah. in that way. Um, and we all, and some of us of course collaborate. That's how I met the guys in the bass gang was mm. through one of the, was through one of these, it's called the bass singing nation. It's a discord server with like 1500 young singers, mostly basses. Um, there's another huge one on Facebook that has like thousands and thousands of bass singers ac across a whole bunch of different kinds of genres and stuff like that. Um, is that is that kind of what you're asking? I don't even know to be honest. I just know that like <laughs> like when like I have friends who are goalkeepers and all the goalkeepers on all the teams like once you hit a certain level they all know each other because it's such a small oh, a, yes that is that is it's like a small community of niches. I mean obviously it's niche but it's such a small community of people that are very good at that one thing and you can't just stick like a forward and goal where you can stick mm -hmm. like a midfielder at forward type deal. Oh yeah, that's definitely a thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, all like the opera world is so small already compared to name, name the other musical genre basically yeah. um, that even, even at this point, like I, I, I know a lot of the names of even other 
other bases at my level, like young artist level, mm -hmm. you know, you, cause you just, it's just, there's just not that many people to keep track of. Um, I mean, I mean, there's like, I don't know, I don't know how many professional opera singers are in the world. There's, I'm sure there's like, you know, 10,000 yeah. or something, but that's pretty tiny. Um, given the entire globe, but yeah, for sure. I mean, like really at the, at the top of the food chain, there's, you know, there's like a handful of like the absolute premier bases that are singing in all the biggest opera houses. There are mm -hmm. not very many, um, you know, probably I want to say, gosh, I don't even know 20 or 25 Dang. Um, at most that are like really at the absolute top of the food chain. Um, and yeah, they definitely know each other. <laughs> yeah, it's the same way with comedians, or it's like there's such a small group, and they all know each other, and they're all like looking yeah. out for each other, like oh, like putting in, oh, you want to open for me at this time, or you want to like let me invite you on this show or do this. Yeah, thing. like there's know. definitely less uh, because of course, op like opera singers, we're all getting hired by the houses, like by the casting directors. So mm. as far as the kind of collaboration there's not as much unless you know some of them want to put together like a recital yeah. on their own but at the same time i mean there you'll end up in this in in productions with people you know if you're yeah. if you're in that group of people that's really sought after you're gonna all be singing at the big houses together yeah i don't really know where i was going with that it was just a curiosity thing more than anything. I, I i think i think we got to the heart of it was just like once yeah. you reach a certain level does everyone know each other in that yeah. in that really specific discipline yeah when all right so you're so now all right so you're in the school now and you've got your youtube you've got your opera stuff and you're doing like musical production of operas what sort of because i saw a picture of you I, I don't remember exactly what you were dressed up as but there was a lot of costume and and mm -hmm. that sort of thing so mm -hmm. outside of the musical sort of singing part of it there's the rest of the performance as well what sort of things go into that uh that besides the singing part okay so there's the singing's the main thing of course but then the whole characterization is a big part of it. Um, I mean, we really do, and and more and more, especially as like HD screening has become a thing. You know, opera they used to call certain certain parts of it just park and bark, meaning you just stand in the middle of the stage in costume and sing. But there's like no real acting now because everything's like I said. There's like all these HD screenings of operas happening, and now we kind of think of our work more like film actors and opera singers. So a lot more goes into the acting and the characterization. So that's a huge part of it. So the singing, the acting, and then once all that's together, you you get in, of course, with the stage director, and then you, you actually put all that stuff on its feet in the opera. So this is, bef this is even before costuming anything, but you're on stage and you, you are now acting out the role with the other people you know, bit like kind of pretending that props are there and stuff like that. So that's the stage director's job is to take your artistic characterization and your singing and then put it all together into an actual show. And then once that's done, then you then it's the costume designer's job and the hair and makeup and all that to now you've got everything ready. Now it's time to actually make it <clears throat> a real thing and bring it to life and really tell a story. So like... For the one we just did, Eugene Onegin is based in Russia in the 1820s. So you learn the Russian, which is really hard. You get all the translations memorized, which is really hard if you're an American-born person. Then you get all the characterization and the acting and all that. And then you put everything on its feet with the stage director. And then the stage designer and the costumer put that whole thing into 1820s Russia. And then it becomes like a living, breathing thing. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's all the main elements. You know, uh, there's, of course, like stagehands and lighting tech and all the other kind of logistical things that happen. But as far as what we do as singers, that's kind of like the four or five main things. Is the acting part, was that difficult for you <clears throat> to kind of adjust to the, as, as, uh, like when you say we treat it more like a film than a, than just yeah. singing was that difficult to get both things kind of the first time you did it to learn how to get both of them um, 
it's, I mean, it's definitely, it's been a thing since I've been doing opera. Um, the park and bark that I mentioned was really back in like, like the last century, oh, like no, 50, 50s, 50s, <laughs> 60s, like before video opera was even a thing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm used to it, but at the same time, it is, it is a huge demand because just worrying about the singing is so challenging. Like I talked about earlier, it takes so long to become a good opera singer that that's huge. That's what we're like trained to be worrying about. So you have to get it to a point where you completely, it's all just muscle memory. And then you can really think about the acting. Um, I was always a decent natural actor. Like I think back to stuff I did in undergrad and like without putting much thought at all into it, it was like, okay, you know, convincing to an untrained eye what I was doing on stage. Yeah. But since then there's been, now I put much, much more thought into the character and what I'm doing with each line and especially really knowing the translations because we pretty much always sing in a different language for opera. There is English opera, but not nearly as much yeah. as Italian or French or German. So now it's like really, really know what I'm saying word for word in the moment. So it's, I'm basically just like, like thinking in real time um, as the character, as opposed to like, I mean, I mean, I remember doing stuff in undergrad and I had no idea what I was saying most of the time. I just knew kind of generally what the feeling was yeah. and like acted out that way. And that's how a lot of undergrad performance is. Because, you know, you have like a 20 year old kid is not going to put in the time and like really learn the translations well and really give a compelling performance. I've never seen it happen in an undergrad yeah. setting. Um, so all of that like and then and you just kind of you adjust your preparation as the level gets higher so like i was better about that of course in my masters than i was in my undergrad still yeah. didn't didn't know word for word all the time what i was saying but everything was more thought out and then of course from masters to now where i'm at now is another big jump of of putting thought into it yeah. it's a big ask though it, it's a big ask to be able to act and i'm not saying we're as good at we're as good as actors as people on you know, the good TV shows and movies, like, they are fucking incredible. Once you know about acting, watching those people work is, like, and it's, like, it's it's absolutely incredible. It's, like, watching Michelangelo. Someone yeah. else really good. Like, if you watch, like, um, just a quick tangent, like, someone like Leonardo DiCaprio, mm -hmm. go from, like... Oh, he's uh, incredible. Oh, my God, he's such a good actor. So, like, we are not on that level. But we are acting a lot better than opera singers were 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, just the amount of roles that he's played, like from Titanic to just freaking Django and Chains. It's Dude, like, it's 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 really remarkable. Yeah. It's really he he is one of a kind. Truly. And that was one of the things I didn't understand. I, I mean, I still don't really understand because I'm not in that world, that performance sort of world. But like to be able to. You hear it about some guys that they just become that character. Yeah. And that's something that is like that extra level of preparation to like really fit in. Well, that's how it always is with anything. Once you jump up to like the really top, top, top levels of it's always the preparation that gets yeah. you there rather yeah. than like, obviously everyone is, they're all talented, but like mm -hmm. it's the preparation that separates it at that. Yeah. Like those little, little things. Good uh, acting, good acting really, because it's a weird balance because you do memorize lines. Mm -hmm. so like it can't be the idea is that it it has to feel so natural as if you don't know the line yet right so yeah. if you're having a conversation as a character it has to it has to be ca like this is what leonardo dicaprio is so good it doesn't look like he's spitting out memorized lines yeah. it looks like that is a real character a real person responding in real time and so it's this weird balance of mem memorizing your lines but still responding as if they were just happening organically. Um, it's a really, really difficult balance to strike. And a lot of us are just, you know, now trying to get the hang of that. Like, cause that's what, that's what really good acting is, is it, is it looks, it looks real, right? It looks yeah. real and it feels real. And even though, even though the lines are all planned, yeah. very difficult, very difficult to do well. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend that was an extra on uh, Tyler Perry's coming to America and he was oh, on cool. the set, and he was on the set for like <clears throat> half the movie as one of the bodyguards or whatever. And when they were filming in Atlanta, Morgan Freeman was there. He got to watch Morgan Freeman work for like three or four days or whatever. Wow! And yeah, it was just like the presence and just like the professionalism was just off the charts. 
I can't even imagine. Yeah, just being it like he's like oh, he's right there. It's like so. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. It's it's strange to see because they're just people, but also they're so good at what they do that it's like you can't help but just be like, whoa. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. insane. I want to touch on the language part that you that you talked mm-hmm. about. Instead mm-hmm. of just memorizing the words, you're doing the translation. Are you studying language outside of like, out like, if you have a piece that's in Italian, for instance, like, are you studying that language outside of knowing that you're going to get that piece? Yeah, we we've um, opera singers all take language throughout undergrad, throughout masters, and we even take language here. Um, mm-hmm. So. I the only one I'm like basic conversational like is Italian probably. Uh, I just haven't. There's way more opera in Italian than any other language, so naturally you're exposed to that more. Yeah. And you know, doing a big role, like let's say I do the role of Don Giovanni, which I haven't performed yet, but I've learned all of. That's like a, a three hour opera, lead role, uh, title role on stage a lot of the time. If you learn that whole role and learn it well and know all your translations word for word, just doing that is going to give you a pretty good idea about the language. Because yeah. it's, it's like thousands upon thousands of thousands of words you have to memorize and know. Um, but we do take we do take language class outside, like formal language training. Um, but also, uh, most opera singers that, that end up having a big career, international career, they end up being fluent in English, German, French, and Italian because you sing like the, the, all those places are big in opera in the opera world. So you end up spending a lot of time there and you just become fluent naturally. Um, so that's what happens to most people. It's like, we, we have a really, really good idea about diction and pronunciation and kind of like basic structures about how to speak it. But then actually going to those countries and performing there is when it all solidifies. Yeah. But yeah, but most 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 big opera stars end up being fluent in a number of languages just by exposure, basically. Is singing in German weird from from the standpoint of just knowing <laughs> just knowing what German sounds like against French and Italian um, it seems less uh, art, artistically pleasing. Yeah, you you you'd think so. I love singing in German, um, and if you look up people singing in German, it can be just as beautiful as the rest. Um, because you, you learn how to work, like in German, uh, it's known for its consonant clusters. Like if I say, ich schwebe, ich schwebe, there's like a lot of, there's a lot of sound in there that's not vocal, basically. Yeah. Unvoiced consonants is the proper term. But you just learn how to use that and kind of sing with that in the artistry. And you can still create this beautiful melodic singing line, even with all those stops, essentially. Um yeah, look, I mean, I could send you a link to some beautiful German art song. You'd be like, this is stunningly beautiful. And it is being sung in a language that on its own doesn't sound that way. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I, I, would, I mean, I would assume that they could make it artistic. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been doing it. Other, for, yeah, otherwise, it would sound bad. Have. Yep, exactly. Well, yeah, just from, but just like you said, the amount of consonants, like it doesn't seem like it's free flowing enough to make it. Right, right. To make it into one of those like iconic pieces or whatever but yeah yeah when, no, it, it can be done it can be done <laughs> oh, <I've, laughs> when you did you always like when you were going growing up and then going into music and like in college and stuff was stage was stage presence something that came naturally to you this is something that also i find very interesting the the more people i talk to some people have had to work at it way harder than others to get like the the nerves out or butterfly or obviously you got yeah i nerves anyways but like was that something that was natural to you i would say so yeah, I mean, I've, um, I've definitely, I've had like anxiety uh, over the, over the years, but never what I would call performance anxiety, which is what mm-hmm. people like. It was like a condition for some. Well, actually, a lot of people suffer from it. I do get like jitters and stuff, but yeah, um, the natural, you know, they, but, but yeah, but there are people who like you know are get throwing up the night before a performance. They get Ooh. so nervous, and that's not me at all. And I wouldn't be doing it if it if if it felt that way. Um, I always, and for me, it's always, I'm nervous a little bit before I go on and like right before I go on, but pretty much as soon as I'm out there in front of the audience, I completely relax. It like feel, it feels more comfortable being out there in front of people than the anticipation. Um, that's, that's interesting. Cause I feel yeah. like for, 
seeing the people out there like you'd think it'd be well, more nerve wracking yeah, right well, I, guess that comes with, I guess that comes with the preparation because like for me the more prepared i am with the like if it's a presentation or whatever the case is like the more comfortable i am with the material the more comfortable i am oh absolutely yeah Yo, yeah, that, if, that if, comes if, across too in the confidence that you have yep. when you do it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. If you if you don't prepare, you will be a lot more nervous. Um, there's a for sure a direct correlation there. That's jeez. Oh, I couldn't imagine <laughs> going out in a costume to make me mm -hmm. look like I was in the 1820s, <laughs> singing in a different language that I don't know. Yep. Yeah. No. That's, props, that's, you know, that's, you, man. Props to you. <laughs> that's why you've got to know your shit before you get out there. Oh. Hey, that's again, like you said earlier, the preparation is everything. Oh. Um, do you mind? I got to run to the bathroom. You're good. I, well, I was just, well, yeah. Did you have more that you wanted to go through? So I was just going to ask uh, you a couple more questions and then depends. Yeah. On yeah. No, I'm, I'm down to chat a bit more. I just got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah. All good. All good. Cool. I'll be back in two minutes. We uh we all went out for drinks last night to celebrate the end of the week, so I've been trying to rehydrate a bunch this morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, you good, man. We were out also as well at uh, it's this place called like Highland or whatever, and they've got games and whatever. There's all these new <laughs> bar places popping up where you can. They have got like cabinets with board games. Oh, really? In huh. Arlington, yeah. Sounds fun. Yeah, I think uh, people are realizing that the kids that were playing Sorry when they were eight are now of drinking yeah. age <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is absurd yeah <laughs> yeah children with drinking permits is yeah 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 uh, uh that's what, what was the other thing I was gonna ask? oh yeah so so now you've done so you've got your the base gang and your peter barber on the hat brand <laughs> you got the logo yeah yeah so is that just the so the base gang for you guys is that what is is that just a, uh, I don't know, hobby is not the right word, side project type thing? Are you guys going and performing places as well? Or is it just kind of like for recording and producing albums and music? For now, it is just the, just recording and producing music because we live so far apart from each other. Uh, Marwan lives in Egypt. Whoa. Tommy, li Tommy lives in the Czech Republic. Bobby lives in Massachusetts. And I live here. <laughs> so, yeah, we got together. It's funny. We were all ambassadors in this bass singing nation group I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a bunch of people in the group and ambassadors, just someone who, like, we kind of represent the group online because we have bigger followings. And, um, you know, if, if we come out with something new, it'll they'll blast it out to the whole group kind of thing. So it's a cool little, little uh, program. And I messaged the three of them because I loved all their work. And I was uh, just like, kind of as a joke, last, I think it was last February, so a little over a year ago, I was like, so guys, when are we going to do a project together? And that just completely snowballed into not only doing a song together, but putting out four songs last year for our first little EP, then putting out a song for Halloween. And now we're, in the, we're very deep in the process of our second EP, which is going to come out in May. Nice. Um, but yeah, but it is, but it, I mean, it is for all of us, it is a side project, but it's, it's a side project that has become a much bigger thing. Yeah. Um, it'd be really cool to perform live. It'd be really, I don't know how it would work though, because we're all bass singers, but we also all sing, like we sing everything, like the whole range up to soprano, um, in our recordings, but there's only four of us and when we're when we put a recording out, I mean it's multi-track. There's like you know forty, fifty track tracks happening, which would be impossible to do in a live setting. Yeah. Um, so I guess we could do some stuff if we just like have the backing track, most of the backing track parts playing while we sing some of them, and then sing the solos would be possible. But it feels more like a it'll probably stay online. Yeah, um, well, that's that's cool. Even so, it's like the connections to other people just are out. It's like another. Persian it's a new bounce ideas off of and yeah you've got and, your own stuff that you're doing you can shoot it over to one of them and be like hey what do you think yeah, about x y exactly exactly and it's and like virtual music has become a very real thing especially during the pandemic um i mean you know we can obviously grow a huge audience online and we make money from our stuff 
streaming and merchandise and YouTube monetization, all that stuff. So you don't even need to be out there performing. And um, it's presented a really cool opportunity for us. You know, we do these projects, we bust ass on them, and then we're super proud of them at the end. And then they're just up there forever for people to for people to see. Yeah, it's really cool that um, that the sort of digital economy is was working its way towards people being able to produce and their own content, whether it's music yeah. or videos or podcasts or whatever the case is, and kind of the internet lets it lets the value of it fall where it may. Um, is also allowing people that maybe wouldn't have had a chance in otherwise to make a name for themselves. Mm -hmm. I know stand-up comics that have released specials on YouTube that never Netflix never would have talked to them five years ago. Right and now, they've got like Nathan, who was on his his stand-up's got like eighty thousand views on YouTube now, but he never would have been Netflix never would have talked to him. But he's hilarious. Yeah. And so yeah. it's it's allowed for this, um, even like these, right? Like I don't like all 30 people or whatever that will watch this, but like <laughs> it's, it's given me the opportunity to educate myself on different, like the thing about like voices being matured, I never would have known that. I also never mm -hmm. would have Googled that either because that is not really relevant yeah, to my I've, life, but it's still exactly. a cool thing. It's still exactly. a cool thing to know. And yeah. I can't go tell, like go reach out to some random person and be like, Hey, can you talk to me about your life for an hour and a half? That's like, like, that's like a <laughs> yeah. weird, that's like a weird proposition. But then when it's like, Hey, I have a, I have a podcast. People are like, yeah, sure. And it's the same yeah. thing for me. Hop on a zoom call. Yeah. yeah. And then you just throw it on the internet and if somebody else learns something about it, then that's kind of, yeah, I don't know. It's cool. It's a cool thing to navigate It's new for me. I don't, when did you start your YouTube channel? recent not super it was re recent ish wasn't it yeah, yeah uh, tech technically i started in 2011 but <laughs> but i didn't do anything with it until uh april of 2020 really yes that was the same as when i started this it was like yeah. May of 2020 i would use it to put up um for for uh, for all opera auditions you do pre-screenings for grad school and stuff so you send yeah. in video of yourself performing a certain number of songs with a certain number of requirements with a with an accompanist mm -hmm. and so i'd use my youtube channel for that but that was it yeah you know then what what made you want to start doing that the, re the reactions and analysis stuff that was um one re the, the main reason was so many people in this actually in this bass singing nation group with all those young singers they really wanted to hear my my take on like famous bass singers yeah, um, and like my thoughts on them basically. And they knew I got my master's in voice and knew a lot about music and the voice and stuff. So that was part of, that was the reason I considered it. And then the second reason that kept me going was like, I, you know, I uploaded the first one and my YouTube analytics just went crazy, like went absolutely crazy overnight. And I was like, okay, <laughs> this takes one tenth of the time of doing covers and it gets more than 10 times the response this seems like a let's do let's keep doing this to keep building traffic to my channel and you could listen to whatever you want also that's the cool part you could do it yeah. whatever you want one right. of the other um jeff jeff castellucci's god rest you merry gentlemen i didn't oh, know yeah. of that until your channel and that that song I really like, but I like hearing different people's arrangements of that song. Oh my gosh, he's and he that, did such a great that job arrangement. With that. Yeah, yeah, and his voice is crazy. Yeah, the, the, super super low bass. Like when you hear it, when people don't know what's coming, and he drops down to like that <clears> super <throat> low, the one where you put the skiing glasses on or whatever it is, <laughs> the pit vipers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, like when it's that low and people don't know it's coming, like I'll show people just to see their reaction. I think Pentatonix yeah. has a similar one. They call it Mitch slept. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The singing, talent. bass Unreal. notes, low voice singing is very foreign to most people, and it's mm -hmm. like spooky and exciting and and awesome. And so that's something because, like, when I hear low notes, like, yeah, I, you know, I I do it up, and and they they do still, I do still love hearing them, and so like my reactions are genuine. But I know how I know how it's all done now, and I can mm -hmm. I can do all of that stuff for the most part. Um, so it's not this foreign thing where it's just like, oh, my God, how are they doing that? It's just like, oh, he's doing a subharmonic and they work like this and he's singing this pitch, but he's really creating a subharmonic on this pitch. And they're doing this and that with the audio engineering. It makes it sound like this. 
And so it's not like this big mystery. So it's like uh, I'm giving people like a look behind the curtain as to how it works. And it doesn't make it any less impressive. It's just is like this is how this is how Jeff is able to sing those notes. Yeah, well, that goes back to what we were talking about before, just the appreciation of like that level of excellence. Like, you know exactly what's happening, but you still have the like. And you give that level of appreciate, like you convey that to everybody else who has no yeah. idea what he's doing and just think that he just, his voice just can right. do that, I'm which like, it can this, obviously, but like yeah. all the reasons why is really cool. It gives like the, it's like, Hey, that sounds like it'd be really hard. And then you're like, yes, actually it's harder <laughs> than you think because this, 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 and this. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's amazing. It's incredible. And this is how it works. Yeah, and it's still with, amazing and incredible after that. <laughs> yeah, I do that with soccer. People are like, "Wow, he curved the ball." It's like actually he did this, this, and these four other things that made that one look easier right. than it really was. Right, right. And then you go down the weeds. I find people like yourself and and others who can just talk about that stuff for forever. And then that's those are the people that like. Sometimes you gotta tell him to shut up because it's like, hey, <laughs> I don't, I don't care anymore that he did this, 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 and this. Like, yeah, yeah it's like my bad. I'll, I'll stop. Yeah, like, they, I find myself doing that. Right, I do find my people. Of course, a lot of people in the comments are always like, "No, you can talk as much as you want about voice science," but I'm like, "No, trust me. If I really, <laughs> really the time, then this little three minute video would actually turn into a three hour lecture, and like." 30 minutes is as long as I want to go. 30 minutes oh, is already, is already yeah, pushing it. Sure. Well, people <laughs> click off at that point. You start talking about different tendons in the voice and it's like... Exactly. Uh, exactly. I didn't if want to I, hear that much. If I, if I mention the thyroid it's a, it's for a very short <laughs> amount of time. <laughs> oh, that's nuts. All right, man. We've been talking for almost an hour and a half. Um, yeah, it's flown by, hasn't it? Uh, really appreciate your time. Learned a ton. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna have to think about a lot of this stuff. But. So, uh, people can find uh, your social media stuff, your base gang and Peter Barber on YouTube. Yeah, what are the? Oh yeah, yeah. What are the Look, channels called? Uh, Peter Barber is the YouTube. Um, from there, you can find everything else I do. It's Peter M Barber on Instagram, um, and the base gang is also on YouTube and Instagram now. We haven't done much on Instagram yet, but. Uh, we do have four big projects coming out in May, the Bass Gang does. Um, each song, we are featuring a different collaborator, which I cannot reveal, but they are, they are big-time people that you will know, uh, which is very, very exciting for us that we're, we're running in those circles now. So keep a lookout for the Bass Gang. May the, may, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> ah, um, uh, may the bass be with you volume two is coming out in may with the may bass king so that be with you yeah that's our that's our thing <laughs> um and uh yes as as far as me i do have hopefully a uh a, a, a fully professionally made music video for a cover that i just finished which i i it might not be coming out until like september but that is also a big a probably my biggest project i've ever done that i'm working on right now that's sick dude all right guys for those listening all the links will, for that will be down in the description um yeah this is what happens when i don't prepare for my podcast and i have no way to end them. <laughs> all right guys uh any last nickels that's all that's all for me yeah thanks all for right, having guys. me with that we'll see you guys next time peace